hey guys welcome to another video this is going to be a short one where i'll be talking about uh, beam and block technology i'll be answering some of your frequently asked questions about beam and block technology and i'm doing that at a site in juja this is an upcoming masonet project uh, it's going to be a four bedroom house the first floor has been done using the beam and block technology uh, they've already been placed and the concrete slab poured and cured now this is the rooftop slab as you can see we have the timber supports and then we have the reinforcement bars and some formwork ongoing so i'll be doing that video uh, at the current state so that you'll be able to appreciate some of the questions you ask now the first question is this why is it called beam to beam technology now to answer that uh, we need to look up now as you can see here we have two two types of beams we have this reinforced beam here and then we have this other reinforced beam over here so why it's called beam to beam is because we have these uh, pre-stressed beams these beams that you see over here they'll be placed right in the middle of this beam and then it will stretch all the way to this other reinforced beam over here so that that's where it gets its name the beam to beam technology so you can call it beam and block technology or you can call it beam to beam so it just depends with the term that you find comfortable now the other question is this where do i achieve cost savings when i decide to use beam and block technology the first cost saving comes from timber supports as in a beam and block slab, you would need less timber supports to support the weight of uh, the slab. In a traditional slab, you would need a lot of timber supports to be able to support the weight of the concrete that will be poured and also for the steel ribbers that will be uh, placed across the slab. So in a beam and block slab, you need less uh, timber supports because you only need to support the weight of the pre-stressed beams and the blocks and there's something that you're, you're able to see as well. In a beam and block slab, the timber supports are placed on the longer span of a room. So in this particular master bedroom, we can see that these timber supports are stretching from where I'm standing to that end, which is the longer span, so that pre-stressed beams will be placed on the shorter span of this particular room. So in your project, in your design, you have to know that beam and blocks will be placed on the shorter span of a room always the other cost saving is in terms of the steel trappers because once you've placed the pre-stressed beams and the blocks you already have a working surface so you won't need uh, steel trappers to have a flat level surface the beams and blocks will do that for you the third cost saving is in terms of uh, steel ribbers beams and blocks the pre-stressed beams have steel tendons inside that have been stretched to such a high degree that they achieve a high tensile strength. So that's where they get their strength from, eliminating the need for steel ribbers, for example. For a beam and block slab, you would need steel ribbers, this kind, for the beams and for the columns. To achieve tensile strength for the concrete slab that will be poured, you only need to lay the BRC mesh, which is definitely uh, cheaper than the steel you would need in a traditional slab. The other FAQ that I get is about safety. Just how safe is a beam and block slab? To answer that, uh, we need to understand the term pre-stressing. Pre-stressing means adding a high value of tensile strength to a beam. And how do you do that? It's the steel tendons inside that have been stretched to a high degree to achieve uh, that high tensile strength. So for example, we have this uh, pre-stressed beam. And as you can see, you can see that we have some steel uh, tendons inside. Uh, they've rusted a bit because they've been exposed to air and water. But I think you can be able to see. So these steel tendons have been stretched to such a high degree that, they, that they're able to achieve that high tensile strength. And that's important because in a beam and block slab, these beams are the ones that are going to play the main structural uh, role uh, for that slab. They're going to carry all the loads, transmit them to the ring beams, to the columns, and then eventually to the foundation. 
remember that the only steel that you will add in a beam and block slab is the BRC mesh which will add tensile strength to the concrete that you will pour on top of the beams and the blocks. Another FAQ is this. Can these blocks fall off? Say I'm sleeping and boom, it falls on my head. Can that happen? I really don't think so. That's just my opinion because these blocks and the beams, they've been held in place by the concrete that has been poured on top. Remember, we are trying to achieve a monolithic slab. That's why we, we've said initially that this technology is also, is also called beam to beam technology. You stretch this pre-stressed beam from this end to that end and it's embedded inside the ring beam. So once you've poured the concrete on top, you've created harmony between the concrete, the pre-stressed beams and the blocks. And remember, the concrete is heavy, so it compresses uh, the blocks to fit snugly in between the pre-stressed beams. Another thing, uh, these pre-stressed beams, they are aligned according to the span of a single block. So in between uh, the two pre-stressed beams is 400 millimeters. The blocks have a chamfer that enables them to sit flush uh, between two pre-stressed beams, and that's 400 millimeters uh, apart. So because of that, the blocks fit snugly, and once the concrete is poured, it's highly unlikely that uh, these blocks will fall off. Now, the final FAQ is about earthquakes. How does a beam and block slab perform in an earthquake situation? To answer that, in all the sites that I've gone to, none has experienced an earthquake. So I'm not even in a position to demonstrate how it looks like in an earthquake situation. Another thing, here in Kenya, earthquakes are quite rare. So even houses are not designed with earthquakes in mind. In high-risk countries where earthquakes are common, I'm pretty sure the engineers there They've done some designs. For example, they've used beam and block technology. There are some things that they've done extra to ensure that the slabs for that particular house, particular project, uh, they won't be compromised in an earthquake. I'm not really in a position to answer this FAQ because I've tried to scour the internet looking for information, looking for case studies here in Kenya where they've used beam and blocks technology in an earthquake situation. I've not seen that study. If there's one, kindly share your knowledge in the comments, share a link. We're all trying to learn, we're all trying to study and understand uh, this technology. So the main reason why people are adopting beam and block technology is cost saving. There's a sweet spot between safety and cost saving. And beam and block technology sits right in the middle. The cost savings, like I've said before, you don't need uh, steel trappers. You need less timber supports. And remember, for beam and blocks, there's a space that they've occupied. For, let's say uh, we are going to pour 150 millimeters of concrete for the slab. Beam and blocks already have has occupied half, like 75 millimeters. So you only need to pour 75 millimeters of concrete. That's a huge cost saving for you because in a traditional slab, you would need to pour concrete from the steel trapper to the required depth as specified by, by the structural engineer. So according to me, I think that's the main reason why people are adopting beam and block technology, the cost saving. So those are some of the frequently asked questions about beam and block technology. And I hope I've been able to answer that uh, in this video. In case you have a burning question you'd like to ask, kindly shoot it in the comments. So thanks for watching. I'm Nick Mema. I'll see you in the next video.